the title for today's message is Change Your Course. And it is an attempt on my part to capture the essence of this principle we call biblical repentance. And we're going to specifically look at the command of Jesus Christ to repent. And as we do that, we're going to consider Christ's message at his first coming. Christ's message at his first coming. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 17, it marks a significant signpost in the ministry of Jesus Christ from Matthew's point of view. Notice how Matthew begins this verse. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now I'm going to share with you uh, what's involved with this word repent, or at least some of the things involved with that, that rich and meaningful term. I'm also going to explain to you what Jesus meant by the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But before I do that, I want to point out something. If you turn back in your, in your Bibles, probably just one page, back to Matthew chapter 3, I want you to look at verses 1 and 2. Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Now in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judah, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And I want you to compare Matthew chapter 3, verse 2, with Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. And I think you'll find that they're very similar. In fact, they're identical in the text. The message of John the Baptist was the message of Jesus Christ. And the message of John the Baptist prepared the way for the first coming of Jesus Christ. Now as we as we think about Christ's message at his first coming, I think it's important that we first consider the backdrop of that message. Namely, that biblical repentance was a major theme of the Old Testament prophets. Turn if you would to Ezekiel Chapter 14. Ezekiel chapter 14. Beginning with verse 1. I've highlighted verse 6 on the slide and, and I, I will unpack that. But I want, I want to set the context for this particular verse and, and demonstrate for you this morning that biblical repentance was proclaimed throughout the Old Testament period. That ever since the fall of Adam and Eve, repentance has been the message of God to sinners on this planet. Ezekiel chapter 14 and verse 1. Then some elders of Israel came to me and sat down before me, and the word of the Lord came to me, saying, now this is a, a, a very interesting phrase that Ezekiel uses in his book. He's the one that uses it more than any other of the Old Testament prophets. He says that the word of Yahweh, the word of the Lord, came to me saying. In other words, the word spoke to him. And the Hebrew word is the bar, and it's the counterpart to the New Testament term, logos. Jesus Christ is the Word. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word uh, was God. And the Word became flesh and tabernacled or dwelt among us. And we, be, you know, we beheld His glory. Jesus Christ is the Word of God. And when Ezekiel writes that the Word of the Lord came to me saying, 
I'm of the opinion that this is Jesus Christ literally speaking to the prophet. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of men, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their hearts. Oftentimes we think of idolatry as, as some old-fashioned expression of, of, of false worship or, or, or false religion. You don't need an idol of stone or wood or precious metal to practice idolatry. Ezekiel makes it very clear that idolatry, first and foremost, is a problem of the human heart. Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their hearts and have put right before their faces the stumbling block of their iniquity. When people practice idolatry, they become spiritually blind. And they blinded themselves with their idolatry. Should I be consulted by them at all? Therefore speak to them and tell them. Thus says the Lord God, any man of the house of Israel who sets up his idols in his heart, puts right before his face the stumbling block of his iniquity, and then comes to the prophet, I, the Lord, will be brought to give him the answer in the matter in view of the multitude of his idols. In order to lay hold of the hearts of the house of Israel, who are estranged from me through all their idols. Their idolatry was a problem of the heart. We can be guilty of idolatry without something physical before us. Anything that replaces God as being preeminent is a danger. Therefore, verse 6, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, repent and turn away from your idols and turn your faces away from all your abominations. So repentance in this passage is a matter of the heart, first of all. Repent and turn away and turn your faces away. Three different times in one verse, Ezekiel uses one of several terms for repentance in the Old Testament. It's the Hebrew word shub, shub. And it, it's used three different times in this passage. And it, it's calling the nation of Israel to, to make a course correction, to do a U-turn. They're following after their idols. They're following after the enemy of God. They're following after the creature rather than the creator. And God is calling them to make a U-turn. A U-turn with their hearts and in their minds. And with that U-turn in their hearts and their minds, there will, be, there will follow a change of conduct and behavior that will reflect outwardly that genuine repentance that's experienced inwardly. Let me read that verse again. Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, Shub, and Shub from your idols, and, and Shub from all your abominations. Repent, 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 turn, 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 change, change, change. The course that you're on, the path that you're on, it leads to destruction, it leads to death. And God is calling his chosen people through the prophet, I, the prophet Ezekiel to change their mind, to change their heart, to change their behavior and to follow after the one true and living God by faith. A second passage from Ezekiel that I'd like to emphasize, chapter 18. Chapter 18, and I'll read verses 30 through 32. 
Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, each according to his conduct. His conduct, his actions, his lifestyle. Declares the Lord God, repent and turn away from all your transgressions. I mean, in the original text, it actually reads, Shubu Vaha Shibu. Repent and turn away. So that iniquity may not become a stumbling block to you. Remember back in, in verse 14? The idolatry of the heart, idols of the heart, it causes the hand to cover the face and it becomes a stumbling block. If you can't see, you're going to trip, you're going to fall, you're going to go the wrong direction, you're going to go down the wrong path. Ezekiel is calling the people to repent from their idolatry, to remove the idols of their heart, to change their lifestyle and to follow the one true and living God. Repent and turn away from all your transgressions so that iniquity may not become a stumbling block to you. Cast away from you all your transgressions which you have committed and make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. That sounds like New Testament teaching. Does it not? A new heart and a new spirit. For why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies, declares the Lord God. God doesn't take pleasure when he judges sinners for their sin. He is righteous, he is holy, and he must do it. But he tells us in his word that he takes no pleasure in it. Therefore, repent and live. That was the message of Ezekiel. That was the message of the Old Testament prophets. That was the message of the Old Testament. Which led up to the ministry of John the Baptist. First of all, let's take a look at Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. Now in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judah, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. Metanoeo. Change your mind. Change your mind. Don't think like you've always thought. Think like God thinks. Think according to the word of God. Live according to the word of God. Repent. Change your mind. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is the one referred to by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make ready the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. How did John the Baptist pave the way for Jesus Christ? By preaching a message of repentance. By proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. By pointing a finger squarely at the religious leaders of that day, the scribes and the Pharisees, who came out to the Jordan River to see this man who dressed in bizarre apparel and ate funny types of food and was preaching a message that was drawing a significant number of people out to a place that nobody ever wanted to visit. John the Baptist drew crowds because he had a message of power. He had a message that, that flowed directly out of the Old Testament. It was a message of repentance. And he was calling the people to repent in order that they might be prepared for the coming king. In order that they might be ready when Jesus arrived on the scene. Later on in this chapter, Matthew records for us that, that John the Baptist said to the scribes and Pharisees, You brood of vipers! You snakes! Who warned you 
about the wrath of God to come. And he called on them to repent as the religious leaders of the day because they weren't true shepherds. They were false shepherds. And just as there were false prophets in the days of Ezekiel and Jeremiah and Isaiah, when John the Baptist came as a true prophet of God, there were false prophets, false teachers, false shepherds leading the people of Israel. And then we read in Mark chapter 1 and verse 4, turn over to that that passage, Mark chapter 1 and verse 4. Actually, I'll let me read the first three verses to set the context. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So Mark records not only the verse that Matthew cites, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, but he adds an additional verse in his account. He quotes Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. John the Baptist was the messenger of Jesus Christ. And he prepared the way for Jesus Christ. He prepared the people and made them ready for the coming of the Lord. Now look at verse 4. John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance. For what? A <coughs> baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. <coughs> Biblical repentance is required for sins to be forgiven. Now, before you object theologically and observe that John's ministry was more like an Old Testament ministry and not like a New Testament church ministry, because Jesus hasn't even died and been buried and risen on the third day yet. Well, I'll invite your attention to Luke chapter 24 and the words of Jesus Christ himself after he died, after he was buried, after he arose again, and before he ascended into heaven. This is Luke's account of the Great Commission. Verses 46 and 47. He said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. That repentance for the forgiveness of sins. In order for a person to be forgiven of their sins, they must biblically repent. They must acknowledge that they are a sinner. They must acknowledge that they are incapable of saving themselves from their sin. They must turn from their sin and ask for forgiveness and believe in the person and work of Jesus Christ in order to receive the gift of eternal life, in, in order to receive the forgiveness of sins. In order to receive the gift of God's Holy Spirit. Repentance is required. I'm afraid that there are far too many people who claim to represent God, who claim to be proclaimers of God's Word, who don't share a gospel of repentance. who never mentioned repentance. It was at the heart of the message of the Old Testament prophets. It was at the center of the ministry of John the Baptist. And it's the first recorded word out of the mouth of Jesus Christ 
at his first coming in the Gospels during his public ministry. The very first word, repent. It's important that we recognize and that we understand this. Now, back to Christ's message at his first coming. Why would Jesus say in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 17, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand? Well, it was because he is the king. And we're told in Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27, that great prophetic passage, that before the beginning of the 70th week, or the 70th seven, after the conclusion of the 69th seven, Messiah, or at the conclusion, actually on the very last day of the 69th seven, Messiah the Prince would come to Jerusalem and present himself present himself as the ruler. Messiah the Prince, Messiah the ruler. And that's what he did in the triumphal entry. He actually made an offer of the kingdom to the nation of Israel, which they rejected. Because they chose to follow their religious leaders rather than follow their Messiah. Only a remnant believed in Jesus when he came. Imagine that. He was physically present. He was on this earth. He lived a perfect life. And yet, the vast majority of his people chose to reject him rather than follow him. Jesus Christ made an offer which was rejected. Now, we know from Old Testament prophecy that it was going to happen that way. It was predicted. But it was still a legitimate offer. When he comes the second time, he'll establish that kingdom of heaven here on earth. And he won't come as the suffering servant. Rather, he'll return as the conquering king, defeating God's enemies, rescuing the chosen people of God, and establishing his messianic kingdom here upon the earth. Now, when we think of Jesus Christ in repentance, it's not limited to his first coming message. Because he has a message in the present. A message to the churches. And if you want to think it in terms of the universal church, that would be appropriate as well. Think, think in terms of every believer who is alive on the planet at any given point in time. That is what makes up the true church of Jesus Christ. And his message to his church is to repent and follow him. Repent and keep his commandments. Repent and and do the will of the Father. Don't think that repentance only has to do with the initial stage of salvation that we call justification. Repentance is also involved, dramatically so, in our sanctification. Because we're still sinners. We still struggle with sin. We still are subject to stumbling. We're still subject to deception. And Jesus Christ calls his church to repent. Now, let me illustrate that for you by just citing the references up on the screen. Revelation 2.5, 2.16, 2.21, and 2.22. Revelation 3.3 3 and 3.19. 
five different times, five different times in the seven letters to the seven <clears throat> churches. He calls five of the seven churches that were <clears throat> existing in Asia Minor in the time that John wrote the revelation of Jesus Christ. Five of the seven churches Jesus Christ called to repent. Repent. Even the church in Ephesus. He called them to repent because they had left their first love. They had started extremely well. They had the advantage of, of apostolic instruction. But they had left their first love and Jesus Christ is now calling on them to repent and change their minds and bring their minds into alignment with His. That's what repentance for the Christian is all about. Think like Jesus Christ. Take off the old man and put on the new. That's what biblical repentance is focused on when someone is already a blood-bought, forgiven believer in Jesus Christ. Now, it's not just in the seven letters to the seven churches that we find five references to repentance. When you think about it, what are the epistles containing? It's the same thing. The apostles, the followers of Jesus Christ, giving instructions to the church on how to live until the king returns. On how to live until Jesus comes to take his bride. And whether it's in the book of Acts, by the way, for those of you who uh, are wondering, we, we are going to return to the book of Acts sometime this year. <laughs> uh, and on, on my calendar, probably uh, beginning in the summer, we'll, um, we'll go back to the book of Acts. It's a great, great time of study in the first 12 chapters. Whether it's the book of Acts or the book of Romans or any of the other the letters of the Apostle Paul, whether it's the book of James, the epistles of Peter, the epistle of Jude, the three epistles of John, the book of Hebrews, it doesn't matter. Every single one of those books deals with living our Christian lives in light of the soon return of Jesus Christ and bringing our lives into alignment with the will of God and with the mind of Christ. Jesus Christ is calling his church to repent. And he wants us as a church to examine ourselves, to examine our hearts, to respond to his word, to recognize that we're sinners. I mean, this week, I was reminded of the struggle. Just with attitudes that I had. And praise God for my wife. She helps me to stay in focus. She helps me to keep things in perspective. And hopefully I do the same for her. God wants us to think like his son in order that we might act like his son. That's how it works. That's how it's been designed. Now, it's interesting to me that Christ has a message at his second coming, but the message at his second coming is not repent. The time to repent is before he comes. <clears throat> if you wait to repent of your sins before he comes, it will be too late to repent. Because he will be here. Look at what it says in the Olivet Discourse. This is, this is Mark's version. Chapter 13, verses 32 to 37. And the, the parallel passage in, in Matthew's account in chapter 24 is verses 42 to 44. 
But of that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. Take heed, keep on the alert, for you do not know when the appointed time will come. It is like a man away on a journey who, upon leaving his house and putting his slaves in charge, assigning to each one his task, also commanded the doorkeeper to stay on the alert. Therefore, be on the alert. For you do not know when the master of the house is coming, whether in the evening, at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning, in case he should come suddenly and find you asleep. What I say to you, I say to all, be on the alert. Now, what is Christ's message in this paragraph? What is he emphasizing? Anybody? Be on the alert. Be on the alert. How many times did he say it? One, two, three, four times in four different verses. Be on the alert. He wants us to be ready. He wants us to be prepared at his coming. Because if we're not prepared, it will be too late. If someone has not yet repented from their, from their sins at his coming, it will be too late. Now, there's some other passages that, uh, that I want to emphasize for you that, that aren't on a slide this morning. Um, turn over to Revelation chapter 9. And I, I want you to get a feel for the picture that the Apostle John paints for us after the wrath of God begins to be poured out upon the earth. All of the passages that I'm going to read for you out of the book of Revelation uh, follow the onset of the wrath of God. Look at the response to the fifth trumpet by the people who dwell upon the earth. Revelation chapter 9, verses 20 and 21. This is in response to the fifth trumpet judgment. And the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, so as not to worship demons and the idols of gold and of silver and of brass and of stone and of wood who can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their immorality, nor of their thefts. Even though they recognized it was the judgment of God upon them, they refused to repent. Look at chapter 16. In response to the fourth bowl, Recorded in verses 8 and 9. Revelation 16, 8 and 9. And the fourth angel poured out his bowl upon the sun, and it was given to it to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with fierce heat, and they blasphemed the name of God, who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent so as to give him glory. Look at the response to the fifth bowl. Recorded in verses 10 and 11 of the same chapter. Revelation 16, 10 and 11. The fifth angel poured out his bowl upon the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became darkened. And they gnawed their tongues because of pain. And they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores. And they did not repent of their deeds. Following chapter 3 of the book of Revelation, it's my understanding every time the word metanaeo is used, it's used of unbelievers who refuse to repent. Now there's one last passage along this line that I want to share with you before we get to our final slide. And that's 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I, I have taught on this passage multiple times I've, I've shared it with a number of Bible studies the last 
three and a half decades. And I find it to be one of the most chilling passages in all of the Word of God. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 deals with the person of the Antichrist and, and with his revelation. He is revealed <coughs> in verses 3 and 4 of 2 Thessalonians 2 when he poses and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God displaying himself as being God. That is when the Antichrist is revealed. That's when people on this planet will know who he truly is. When he commits the abomination of desolation. Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things, as you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he may be revealed? For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. That can also be translated in the middle voice until he steps out of the way. Middle and passive are identical in New Testament Greek. And then the lawless one, then that lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. So he's going to be revealed. It's going to be revealed when he is no longer restrained. That is, the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. Now, I want you to follow closely what's recorded next. And for this reason, for what reason? For the fact that they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. They refused to repent. They refused to believe. They followed the Antichrist rather than the Christ. They followed the creature rather than the creator. For this reason, verse 11, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they might believe what is false. In the original, it's actually, a, a better rendition would be in order that they might believe the lie. There's a definite article there. And what is the lie? What is the lie of Satan? The lie of Satan is that men can become God. The lie of Satan is that Antichrist is God. And that's what's in view in this particular <coughs> passage. The Antichrist declaring himself to be God, taking, him, taking his seat in the Holy of Holies itself, in the temple in Jerusalem. There's going to be a third Jewish temple built someday, and the Antichrist is going to desecrate it. For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they might believe what is false, in order that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth, but took pleasure in wickedness. Why are all of these people refusing to repent? In Revelation chapter 9 and Revelation chapter 16? Well, part of the reason is because God has sent a deluding influence in order that they might keep believing what they have believed, namely that Antichrist is God. When Jesus comes back, his message is not repent. When Jesus comes back, his message is be ready before I come. Be prepared at my coming. Be alert. Be awake. Be connected. Repent and believe. As was recorded in Mark chapter 1. Out of the mouth of Jesus Christ. Well, pretty Pretty sober passages. This is a sober principle. Repentance is a serious thing. God takes it seriously. And so should we. As we conclude today, I, I, I want you to get a handle on biblical repentance. 
And whether you're already a believer in Jesus Christ today, or you haven't yet called upon the name of the Lord, you have not yet become a Christian and placed your faith and your trust in the person and work of Jesus Christ, you've not yet repented of your sin. These passages are speaking to you. You know, no matter, no matter what your personal situation, change your course today. That's what that little arrow, that, you know, Jerry put this graphic in for me. It represents a U-turn. That's what repentance is all about. You're heading one way, the wrong way, and you make a U-turn and you head the right way. And you can repent as an unbeliever for saving faith, and you can also repent as someone who is already a believer in order to get back on the right path, in order that your conduct and your behavior might come into alignment with what God says to be the straight and the narrow way. Look at what the author of Hebrews records in chapters 3 and 4. <coughs> three different passages. First, Hebrews 3, verse 7, to the first half of verse 8. Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as when they provoke me. In other words, if you hear the voice of God today, don't harden your hearts. Deal with whatever issue you need to deal with, but deal with it today. Verse 15 of the same chapter, while it is said, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as when they provoked me. And then verse 7 of chapter 4, he again fixes a certain day, and it's today. It's not tomorrow. We have no guarantee of tomorrow. He again fixes a certain day today, saying through David after so long a time, just as had been said before, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. God doesn't want us to respond with hard hearts. God wants us to respond with broken hearts. Because broken hearts express themselves in biblical repentance. God loves when people repent. Because they're aligning themselves with his will, with his word, and with his way. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to share a message about biblical repentance. Father, I pray that you would take these passages and Penetrate our hearts and minds with them. Father, if there are areas in our lives that we need to deal with and address, Father, help us to respond to the prompting and leading of your Holy Spirit to do so. Father, if there's anyone here who doesn't yet know Jesus Christ by faith, I pray that they would acknowledge their sin before you. I pray that they would repent of their sin turn from it and believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ for their sins. Father, how we rejoice that you are the God who does not doom us to what we actually deserve because of our sin. How we praise you, Father, that Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's not only the message of the New Testament, Father. It's quoted in the New Testament from the Old Testament. And the prophet Joel. Father, we pray that we might respond in a way that would please you. And we ask it in Jesus' name.